Everybody know what that means? It means I'm retired. So um, what I'm going to do is, in my retirement project, is to write this, Irrigation Scheduling for Dummies. So um, it'll be out, and, you know, maybe before I die. I don't know. So uh, important irrigation management decisions. When do you start irrigating? Now, I looked at the schedule here. I don't know if anybody actually talks about when to start irrigating, but I'm not going to. Uh, the second thing is how much water to apply, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Other things is how do you design the irrigation system and our deficit irrigation practices to mix, ma minimize production losses and maximize food quality. I will say that when to start irrigating in general, any of the physiological processes that you can measure are all highly correlated with one another and with soil water content. So if you use midday leaf water potential or stomatal conductance or any of these other means, again. So I'm of the opinion that it's either plant-based or soil-based or even water budgeting based can be used to determine when to start irrigating. So once you do decide to irrigate, then I would use uh, reference ET, uh, I would calculate ET as a product of reference ET and crop coefficients. So what affects water use in your vineyard? Evaporative demand. Where can we get evaporative demand? Simus. Or you also have weather stations there. Uh, other things that affect it is seasonal growth of the vine and growth is driven by temperature, so it's a function of degree days. Ultimate canopy size, is, as uh, um, it was pointed out earlier, trellis size is going to have an effect. Spacing between rows is going to determine how much water your vines use on a per acre basis, and again, the amount of water in the soil profile. So evaporative demand is a function of net radiation, VPD, and wind. And reference evapotranspiration is the method of evaporative demand, and you can get that from Simus. So you can then, is Alex here? How do I move the, um, well, like okay. Just like that. Just like that? Oh, that means I gotta be able to manipulate, okay. So, it's a function, uh, you can calculate ET as a function of reference ET times the crop coefficient. It predicts ET of a non stressed crop growing under optimum conditions. So, how many here would want to irrigate their vines at full ET? Anybody? All right. Maybe if you're a raisin grower, table grape grower. Uh, maybe early in the season, the wine grape grow in the San Joaquin Valley. So again, a reference ET is response to the climate, uh, the, the effect of the grass reference crop on climate. Then you also need a crop coefficient or a KC factor to ultimately predict ET. So the crop coefficient is a function of water used by specific crop. The KC equals ET divided by reference ET. It depends on stage of crop development, degree of cover, crop height, and canopy. So to get a KC, you need to what? You need to measure ET somehow. Later this afternoon, or maybe even this morning, they're going to be talking about how you can actually measure ET of your vineyards or, or, or other crops. Again, the KC relates evapotranspiration of a disease-free crop in large fields under optimum soil water and fertility conditions and achieving full production. Again, it is going to give you water use of a non-stressed crop or a non-stressed grapevines, and this is from Durham and Peru out of 1977. So reliable crop coefficients to take into account seasonal growth of the vine. If you shoot to this long, you're going to use less water than if it's at full canopy. So the crop coefficient should take that into account. Final canopy size, it's a function of the trellis that you have there. Row spacing, again, as, as Alex pointed out, the closer the row spacing, the greater water use per unit land area. And also possible differences in growth, canopy size due to cultivar and or rootstock. If you have a VSP, rootstock's not going to have a lot of effect on the canopy that you ultimately develop because you're going to keep it Restricted, and you're probably going to trim it once it gets above the top wire there. This is the, this would rootstock may have an effect on a California sprawl type trellis system with large row spacings. 
And theoretically, this is what the crop coefficient would look like. You have a seasonal initial KC, the crop develops, you get a maximum canopy in your vineyard, it's going to remain constant. Now, I'm of the opinion that if you're irrigating your vines at full ET, the KC will not start decreasing after mid-canopy here. And I'll show you why in a little bit. So these were the crop coefficients uh, from, pamph uh, from leaflet 2142.8 in 1987. And it was just for the San Joaquin Valley grapes. As far as I know, they had no crop coefficients for coastal grape growing regions in California. So when I'd ask people on the coast, do you use KC crop coefficients? They said, no, we don't have any that, that's any good. Evapotranspiration in that leaflet uh, depend on the percentage of ground shaded by the crop. So if you have more crop, you have larger shaded, canopy, shaded area, and so you're probably going to use more water under those conditions. You have a greater KC. So this is from uh, 1998 FAO uh, paper number 56. They did in this particular paper, they have raisins or table grapes, and then they also had wine grapes. And what we see here is that these KC values for raisin and table grapes are larger than they are for wine grapes. But it didn't differentiate between a VSP trellis and a, and a, and a sprawl trellis, or a sprawl canopy. And this was put out by Durham, Bruce, and Pruins in 1977. The KC value for grapes will vary considerably with cultural practice such as vine and row spacing. So they did consider that in 1977. It's also a function of trellising. So they, they thought about it then, uh, height and span, and the extreme varietal differences in vegetative growth. Now that study that Alex was talking about that we did at the Kearney Ag Center with different cultivars, I was always of the opinion that there's not a lot of differences in canopy sizes as a function of cultivars. There's a big difference in canopy sizes because of cultivars. Petit Verdot has a small canopy all the time. Cabernet Sauvignon in the San Joaquin Valley has this huge canopy all the time. So, in 2009, uh, Allen and Pereira came out with something, and so they're now looking at ground cover here. High density, you cover about 70% of the ground, uh, medium density 50%, low or young 25%. So they uh, differentiated table grapes and also table and raisin grapes and wine grapes here. And so they're now starting to say, well, maybe we should take these things into consideration. But how does something like that assist you if you're a wine grape grower and you have a VSP or, or a GDC or some of these other types of trellis systems that we're alluded to. So what we need to do is actually come up with a means of determining what type of crop coefficient that one should have. So there are me methods to measure ET in a vineyard. This will be discussed, I think, later today, Bowen, Surface Renewal, Eddy Covariance. I have measured ET using the soil water balance method up here in Napa in the Chardonnay vineyard down in the Carneros region. And I also had a lysimeter installed at the Kearney Ag Center in which we planted Thompson seedless grapevines. This is the lysimeter down there with Thompson seedless vines in it. And so what we did is this is the crop coefficient. On this axis here, I expressed it both as a function of degree days from um, 50% bud rate and also day of the year here. And so I measured ET with the lysimeter. I collected ETO data from the Simus weather station at the Kearney Ag Center, and then I calculated the crop coefficient here. And so what we see is it looks very similar to what I, the patterns I showed you earlier in which canopy increases, the crop coefficient increases, at mid-season it levels off, and I didn't put down what happened way here at the end here. This is from 1991 to 93. I cooperated with an entomologist and we decided we're gonna see what the effect of irrigation amounts have on variegated leafhopper. And by 1993, the vines had been defoliated very close to the end of harvest time here. So I decided not to include a complete drop off here. I left them at this particular stage here. So it increases the canopy, uh, increases, levels off at mid-season, and actually it follows a pattern of degree days a little bit better, the r square value is a little bit better for degree days versus day of the year. This is the next three years in which we actually controlled the leafhoppers. 
The end of the irrigation season is day 300, which is the 1st of November. And so what we have here is the KC increases and then stays extremely high till right to the very end. So I'm of the opinion that if we have a crop coefficient, it does not start decreasing later in the season. It goes up, remains high, and then when you stop irrigating, it ultimately will go down. So, based on the previous slide and data collecting Chardonnay grown in Carneros, and again, I found that up there, if I irrigated 100% VT right through the end of the irrigation season, the KC remains very high and does not decrease. So, technique for estimating the crop coefficient. And this is data from a lysimeter. So what I could do with the lysimeter is it's Thompson seedless. It's a two foot cross arm. I could probably transfer the KC I developed there down to maybe Kern County, Bakersfield, uh, maybe Northern California, maybe uh, up in the Delta area for a, a California sprawl. But is there any other way I could perhaps transfer data collected here? And there's a farm advisor named Bill Peacock down in the San, San Joaquin Valley who said, if you measure the shaded area, or calculate the shade out of the vine, it might help you come up with water use of your vines. So what I did in 1998-99, I measured the shaded area under the vine here, and I also expanded it so I was able to raise it. You know, it was a California sprawl. I raised the canopy up so it, it went up straight like that. I kept it up for about two weeks, and then I let it fall back down, and this is the results here. So water use increases and increases, and I raise the canopy up there. And what happened when you raise it up, it actually increased, and, and what we get here is the vines were using almost 16 gallons of water a day. Now, I would expect maybe for a VSP trellis up in the North Coast, that might be enough water for a week, maybe two, I don't know. But 16 gallons a day. When we put the canopy back down, water use went back down, and then we cut the canes because they were pretty long. So the conclusion from this is that it's the orientation of the canopy and not leaf area LAI per se that determines grapevine water use under these conditions. Because when we raise the canopy, we still have the same leaf area, we still have the same LAI, but it was the orientation of the canopy that determined water use of those vines under those conditions. We then looked at the relationship between the percent shaded area under vines and the crop coefficient in 1998-1999. And what we have here is a linear relationship. The slope of this line here, was, oh, the intercept is almost zero, and the slope of the line is 0 0.017. So theoretically, if you knew the shaded area of your canopy, and let's say it was 40%, you would go, OK, my crop coefficient should be about 6.6 6 .6 or 0.65 or something like that. Theoretically, if you were able to use this, that's what you could perhaps use. Well, this is the relationship between my lysimeter vines, and we also had a peach tree growing in a lysimeter kearney, and that was the relationship they found for peaches in 1990 to 94. This is for almonds by a Ferreris published in 1982, showing very young trees increase like that. And so what we see here is that, well, the relationship is similar between grapes, peaches, and almonds. And then I also found this one, then it's also, this is the, the, the basal crop coefficient of beans by these guys, almost right on top of mine. So maybe this relationship between shaded area and the crop coefficient is useful in many different situations. Other estimates of KCs uh, using ground cover. The first one is, is the, the peach tree study. This is from Australia, 0 0.018. My re Slope was 0 0.017. Pinchani Taurus using a Wayne lysimeter in Spain, 0 0.02. Lopez Urea uh, using a Wayne lysimeter, 0 0.017, 0 0.017, exactly the same as mine. And those three from Spain were done on Tempranillo, not Thompson seedless. Then lastly, there's one on Ferreira, uh, published in Irrigation Science. Uh, the work came out of Portugal, and they got a slope of 0 0.019. So again, it looks like these are very close to one another. And maybe it can be concluded that 
or Lopez Urea said it can be concluded that measuring canopy cover is a reliable approach to estimate KC values in grapevines. The use of growing degree days would improve the precision of the estimate by removing year to year variation in crop development. Using degree days is good because I could take my crop coefficient I developed at Kearney Ag Center and put it down in the Coachella Valley for, ta Valley for table grapes because their bud break down there is January 15th, not March 15th. And so you can use it down there. And so maybe you don't actually have to measure ET to come up with reliable estimates of crop coefficients in vineyards. Maybe you don't. I had developed a crop coefficient for Chardonnay grown uh, in Carneros region. Uh, the white points are from KC calculated in 1994. This is the, the equation fitted to it. In 1999, I went up there and measured a shaded area there. And it, again, it falls along this curve fairly well. So that was good. I did a study in Madeira from 1990, uh, 2001 to 2005 on Merlot. California sprawl, 12 foot growing, 12 foot rows. And I measured shaded area across five growing seasons. And what we're able to do is we can see that they follow a very similar pattern from year to year if you express it as a function of degree days. You can then come up with a crop coefficient. Again, a 12 foot row spacing, the KC here, the maximum KC would be 0 0.7 in this particular vintage. So for a California sprawl on 12 foot row spacing, your max KC would be 0.7. I'm of the opinion that if you went to 11 foot row spacing, it'd be 0.76, and if you went to 10 foot row spacing, it'd be 0.84. So in other words, if you go for your California sprawl, get more narrow row spacing, your KC, the maximum KC does increase. So do cultural practices affect vine water use? Uh, I had a study with um, Fresno State uh, and a Syrah vineyard west of Fresno in which we went out and we looked at hand pruned vines of Syrah versus mach simulated machine pruned vines. Uh, we collected the data on the percent shaded area in 2003, 2004, and 2005, hand pruned, a simulated machine pruned. Essentially, maximum shaded area between the, uh, the hand pruned and the mas uh, machine pruned vines were very similar to one another. And so what we have here, uh, Maximum uh, shaded area is about 47%. In 2004, I went to see if there was any difference early in the growing season. So this is hand pruned, machine pruned. And again, the machine pruned vines put out a little bit more vegetative biomass early on so that they may use a little bit more water early on. But ultimately, they both come together. And so again, for the machine pruned versus the hand pruned vines, I would not use different crop coefficients for those two things. And so this is what the the crop coefficient would be for that maximum here would be 0.8. My 12 foot row spacing for California sprawl was 0.7. So again, this does indicate that by measuring shaded area, it might help improve coming up with the crop coefficient. Cultural practice, how great are differences in canopy coverage among vineyards as a function of location and or owner with the same trellis system? <clears throat> so in the year 2000, I went to various vineyards around California. The care center is the Kearney Ag Center. R.H. Phillips is the vineyards over in the Dunnigan Hills area of, is it Yolo County? Yep. Then Yolo County. And then also, hey, I ventured down to Temecula there. And so I measured shaded area in Temecula in 1998 and 1999 and the others in the year 2000. These are quadrilateral cordons, all on a 12 foot row spacing. We can see towards the end here, um, that we do get about the maximum shaded area across those regions here. So again, if you have similar types of trellises on the same type of row spacing, you're gonna get various shaded areas there. And you would maybe expect is that the KCs for those would be similar. This is a liar trellis system. <clears throat> I measured the canopies at 
the Mon uh, Mondavi's here in Napa, the Oakville Field Station, R.H. Phillips over in the Dunnigan Hills and down at the Care Center for the Liar here. And so again, there were differences. Ultimately, the, the, the final canopy sizes in the upper percent shaded area for six foot of row spacing are very similar, except for you to see those circle around those two dots there. That's at the Kearney Act Center and at the uh, R.H. Phillips. Again, for these liar systems, they let the, the, the shoots grow much longer, and then they ultimately hedge them to get them back into the trellis here. So again, there are differences among different um, vineyards and different uh, owners or, or operators of those particular vineyards that one may have to consider when they come up with crop coefficients. But ultimately, these were all on a 9-foot row spacing, 10-foot and 12-foot row spacing. So the 9-foot row spacing up here percent shaded area, so its KC would be higher. Uh, Oakville Field Station, uh, a three foot, a ten foot row spacing, their KCs would be in here, and then at twelve foot row spacing, they'd be down here. So again, what I have is some data to indicate that even in different various situations, you can get the percent, the same percent shaded area for these different of these same types of trellis systems and row spacings. So this is my lysimeter at the Kearney Ag Center. It was covered with plastic in 2009 several times here. We can see it's covered with plastic. We also measured sap flows in those particular trunks during that time here. And we we're measuring sap flow to determine whether or not we could take that in different areas of California to come up with ET values for those, those vines there. My ultimate conclusion is that you can't do that with sap flow sensors. But the other thing is that what percentage of a T is evaporation or soil evaporation? By covering that, grapevine water use was reduced about 11%. When I developed the KCs for these vines, again, I didn't cover the, 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 the vine with plastic. So when you cover it with plastic, that's sort of the basal crop coefficient you have for these, which doesn't include evaporation. And so again, uh, all, all the cases that I've come up with, I'm assuming that you do, uh, are also including the evaporation of water from the soil. Again, my KC was reduced from an average of 1.07 to 0.93, a 13% uh, re reduction over that particular uh, growing season. So, if you wanted to come up with a KC for your particular vineyard, you could theoretically go out there, measure the distance that the can be covered, and let's say the row spacing is 10 feet, the distance the can be covered is on average four feet, so your coverage would be 40%. You would then take that 40% and multiply it by 0 0.017, which is, anybody have any idea? I, 0.6, is it 0.68? What's 40 times 0 0.017? Anyway, that, that's the way you do it. You'd also have a calculator with you so you could come up with that right away. So that's the way you should do it. And if you've developed your own and you plot it versus thermal time or degree days, theoretically, once you've done it once, you shouldn't have to do it again. So this is a map of where I've done irrigation studies across the state of California. I developed the crop coefficient for a VSP trellis in Carneros here. I've done a study with the VSP trellis in Livermore Valley on a different cultivar, in Gonzales on Chardonnay, in Paso Robles on um, Cabernet, in Edna Valley on Chardonnay. So I was able to determine whether or not the crop coefficients I used was, was, was reliable. So I had a crop coefficient for a seven foot row spacing. In Livermore and in Oakville, I had six foot row spacing, so my maximum KC would go up. Seven foot down to six foot, you get more coverage, so your KC goes up. In Gonzales, I had an eight foot row spacing, and Paso Robles had a 10 foot row spacing. So again, there's different types of trellises, different types of canopies that you have in your vineyards for wine grapes. This is what the VSP trellis on from six to 11 foot row spacing look like. 
Again, initially, I had this all as a degree days from March 15th, generally in the coastal regions. I've now used April 1st as the starting date to start accumulating degree days. Those particular lines look like these equations here. So VSP, six foot row spacing, this is the KC. The maximum KC that you have is 0.87. Uh, let's say for a 10 foot row spacing, your maximum KC is 0.52. The rest of the equation here is similar from uh, six foot down to uh, 10, 10 foot. California sprawl, I developed the KC down up in the Madeira vineyards down here. The KC for a 12-foot row spacing max would be 0 0.70, this would be 0.84, and what we have, these values here do differ from these, so the canopy development does differ comparing a sprawl versus a VSP. Quad cordons, this is what I developed here, and the layered system, so this is what I developed for them. If you're a table grape grower in the San Joaquin Valley, this is the crop coefficient that you get for an open gable trellis system. You get a maximum KC of 1.0. I'm sorry, maximum KC of 1.40. I hate to say this, but that's as much water as almonds use. <laughs> okay, pretty close to it. So we're lucky we don't do that up here. So. How much is estimated vineyard ET affected by location in California? So I went to three locations, took data from them. I assumed that the vines were a California sprawl and 11 foot row spacing. I went to Carneros, Lodi, and Parlier. This is the degree days in, in uh, Carneros, 1575. And again, this is degree days using a, a base of 10 degrees C, not, not degree. Uh, Fahrenheit. So I always used to show this slide in my class that I taught on raising table grape production. Of those three areas, where are you going to use the most water? Of course, everybody would say Parlier, and you would use the least amount of water in Carneros. And, you know, they're, they're right, but the, you see the difference between the accumulation degree days between the two? Carneros is only 59% of that in Parlier. This is what the crop coefficients would look like, and what we can see here is that the, uh, that the increase in the crop coefficient in Carneros does lag behind that of Parlier. So again, that's where the crop, that's where the degree days of, uh, kicks in and affects your ultimate crop coefficient as you, you accumulate during the season. This is just what a few are. This is reference ET. So degree days with 54% reference ET in Carneros is 84% that in Parlier in 2009. That's not that big a difference here. And lastly here is estimated ET using the crop coefficients we have here. Parlier would be 31 inches, Carneros about 23. So Carneros is about 77% that that would expect in Parlier. So that's what's Great about using KCs as a function of degree days, and you have reliable ETL values, is that you can say, if I want to plant my vineyard in a different location, how much water might I expect it to use? How much is estimated vineyard ET affected by trellis type and row spacing at a single location? So I have a VSP on 6 and 10 feet and a California sprawl on 10 and 12 feet. So this is the crop coefficient as a function. It's a function of degree days, but this is day of the year in 2007. Again, the KC is much lower for the VSP on 10-foot row spacing versus the VSP on 6-foot uh, row spacing. The same for California sprawl. The sprawl, the KC is higher for the 10-foot uh, sprawl versus the 12-foot sprawl. So again, if you're considering in a specific location how much water you might need depending on the type of trellis, you can again use this type of information to come up with a sort of an answer. And so what we have here, as you might expect, the California sprawl on a 10-foot row spacing uses the most water. Sprawl on the 12 uses the next 
the VSP on a six foot row spacing isn't that much different from the California sprawl on a 12 foot row spacing. So I don't know whether you could perhaps buy less vines by going the California sprawl on a on a 12 foot row spacing versus a VSP on a six foot row spacing and still use about the same amount of water. So that's what's good about this. So one can also take historical ETO data and degree days from estimated bud break and devise a seasonal irrigation regime using the equation ETC equals ETO times KC. Weekly irrigation throughout the current season would then be revised if needed. This works well for the San Joaquin Valley. We put it in the raisin production manual put back out in the year 2000 here. So again, you can come up with your own spreadsheet. If you have the trellis type that you have, you have a, the local reference CT from some location, you can plot those into a spreadsheet and follow that using historical values. Again, you would then figure out how you might have to start it. So when I went to all these different irrigation studies, here's what I would usually do. Monday morning, I'd go into my office, get down and go to the UCIPM website with the most recent degree days, and usually that was from the Sunday before Monday. So if Monday was the 11th of June and Sunday was the 10th, I'd get degree days up to the 10th. I would then calculate my crop coefficient based on that value right there for this coming week that I have here. And again, as I said here, that, that value would be used to calculate the appropriate KC for the coming week. You could then obtain historical ETO for the coming week or, and multiply the KC by that, or take the previous seven days ETL value and multiply the, 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 the number by the KC. In all my studies, what I did is I took the, the KC, or the ETL values from the week before, the seven days before, and then I would multiply that times the crop coefficient that I obtained using degree days up to that Sunday before I took those values here. I usually use millimeters in calculating it because it converts directly to liters for the week. So one millimeter covering one, mil, one square meter equals one liter. And then I would divide that by 3.78 to give me gallons. So it, it's, it's pretty easy. So goal of irrigation management, and this is from Mark Batney. Your goal should be to grow vines with a uniform degree and pattern of water stress every season. The degree of stress is determined by the you, the grower. To do this, you need to adjust irrigation timing and amounts to take into account unique growing conditions in any season and weather, evaftermath, and temperature is a variable component that exerts the most influence on irrigation requirements. It influences the irrigation requirements temperature does by affecting the canopy development. And that is a function of degree days. The weather then also affects reference ET or ETO, and you get that each week when you download the data here. So how can one use the calculation of venue DT to assist in the deficit irrigation strategy? And you've already seen this particular slide here. In this Merlot study in Madeira, I decided to irrigate once my, my control treatment or my 1.2 treatment got to below 10 bars or minus 1.0 megapascal. Once I got to that point here, I said initiation was start, and then this was deficit irrigated at 40% of ET throughout the remainder of the growing season. This one was deficit irrigated 80%, and this was irrigated theoretically at about ET or a little bit higher than that. So again, that's how you have to, if you deficit irrigate, a sustained deficit irrigation or a regulated deficit irrigation, the requirement is that you know what ET is for that particular trellis system, canopy, and so forth. And so then once you do that, then you come up with your stress factor. So if ET is 10 millimeters a week and your stress factor is 0.7, you reduce that irrigation requirement to 7 millimeters per week or whatever. This is what it looked like from Carneros from 1994 to 2001. These values here are estimated ET. This is ETO in this particular slide here, or column here, estimated ET. And so across those eight years, the high was about 20 inches, 
and our low is about 14 inches. So there's, you know, there's a 30% difference there in those particular values here. And so the question is, if this is the way it irrigated, and again, this is, this is the lowest because it had the lowest degree days and one of the lowest ETO values. So again, I took into consideration how much water to apply by looking at degree days and also reference ET. This is one of the highest degree days and one of the higher uh, ETO days. So again, this gives me the highest. So what I did at the end of those eight years, I would go out there before harvest and measure leaf water potential. And a midday leaf water potential of greater than 10 bars or greater than 1.0 megapascal is what I term a non-stress value here. So, irrigation commenced when we got to about minus, minus 10 bars. I want this value here to be close to 10 bars or minus 1.0 megapascal. Across the eight years, it was right on the, the 10 bars. So what I'm assuming here is my estimate of ET at 100% was very close to being a non-stress value. I also have treatments at 0.25% of ET, and what we get here are values at about minus 14 bars in this particular vineyard. So. I feel pretty good. This is uh, Oakville, and again, I use the crop coefficient developed in Carneros for seven foot rows for a six foot row spacing. Our 1ET, again, our values are greater than 10 bars, or less negative than 10 bars. The 25% is about 14 bars. So I took those crop coefficients developed in one situation and transferred to another and got very similar values for the measurement of vine water status. And again, you saw this slide here. This is from uh, Paso Robles. My 1.0 is, again, greater than minus 10 bars. Our 25% treatment is around 14 bars. So again, that was on a 10-foot row spacing that I developed, that I transferred from a 7-foot row spacing for the KC. And uh, this is down in Temecula. This is my California sprawl. Again, my 1.0 treatment is above 10 bars. My 25% treatment is around 14, 14 bars at the end of the growing season. And uh, if you ever see handouts, this, this is on the handout that I, I, I provided. And will that be available? Uh, yes, it will be available, yes. So. The other thing you can do with these things is how much water is used by vines as a function of phenology throughout the growing season. And I think you saw a little bit of that from Alex earlier on. Here's what I found. Thompson seedless from bud break to bloom uses 10% of its seasonal total here. Bud break to verasion 40% and this is harvest here. Chardonnay up in Carneros 10 and 38. Almost exactly like Thompson seedless. So if you know how much water is in your soil profile and your vines are only going to use um, 16 inches, do you have 1.7 inches of water in profile? You probably do. You probably don't need to irrigate up to even bloom time by using these values here. Merlot in the San Joaquin Valley and, and the red cultivars we had at the Kearney Ag Center, about 10% between bud break and bloom. These are a little bit higher here. You better know why they might be higher than my whites. The variation is a little bit later for reds than they are for whites. So that's why this is about 50% here. So again, this allows you to determine, well, if I do some water budgeting, how much is that water in my soil profile going to last? And you can do that by calculating ET versus using reference ET and crop coefficients. And determine how much that water is going to last you until you actually have to start irrigating. So that's how water budgeting can be used. This is uh, Cabernet in Oakville in 2000, Cabernet in Oakville in 2003. Uh, this is on a six foot row spacing and this was on a uh, nine foot row spacing here. This is Cabernet in Paso Robles here. And what I found with, with these up in the north coast and the central coast is instead of about 10%, we're using 15 to 18%. 
from bud break to bloom time for these reds. We use about 58 to 60 percent here, 55 to 60 percent, very close to what the others were. And so again, if you come up with a budget like this, you can determine, okay, this is how much I might need, this is how much I might have available, and so forth. So, I'm going to slow down. Things you can do to simplify irrigation management. Collect three degree days from bud break each year and determine degree days as a function of phenological events. Know what that is each year. Generally speaking, what I found for my crop coefficients with everything other than the VSP is that full canopy occurs about 750 degree days after you start, if it's March 15th or date of bud break. Download ETO data from the closest SIMA station or by other means. I'm sure there's other stations out there you can do. Download and record rainfall amounts and, and events. Estimate soil water availability. And I'm going to ask everybody here. How many here actually measure the amount of water that you apply? Oh. Do that. Now, I have asked some crop consultants. I was at a meeting in Davis many years ago. I asked, they have five crop consultants up there. I said, how many of you up there actually measure how much water you apply? Nobody raised their hand. That is the best thing for you to do to know how much you apply. The other thing would be, know how much you apply as a function of bloom, verasion, harvest, and so forth. That be knowing how much you apply at those particular times here. If what you did one year proved to be good, and you recorded degree days and phenologic events and so forth, you can use that as your schedule to schedule irrigations in coming years as a function of those various things. You don't need anything that, that you're going to learn here today. <laughs> so for you, irrigation management and your sustainability, you want to maintain productivity over time. You want to maximize fruit quality. The big thing you always hear is you want to increase water use efficiency. In general, if the vineyard is irrigated, any reduction in applied water will automatically increase water use efficiency. I'll guarantee it. So if you want to say, I'm going to increase water use efficiency, just apply a little bit less water. You want to minimize or maximize soil water depletion against the function of soil type, rooting depth, cover crop management, and so forth. Cover crops is good. Uh, we did a cover crop study at Kearney. And by having a cover crop from bud break to probably after bloom time, we use 40% more water than the vines that were clean cultivated. So cover crops can use a lot of water. But in a lot of instances like this year, you probably want to have a cover crop to use that excess water that might be in your vineyard. Some of the above factors will be a function of location in California and the price of your grapes. Lastly, from the master himself, Dr. Mark Matthews. He taught an extension irrigation course for many years with Mike Anderson in which we discussed several technologies and always taught that you can make any of them work if you invested yourself in it, pay attention, impose some different irrigation regimes, and take notes and data. At the time, we knew there were folks making each of them work. So again, you can come up with your own, you can devise your own irrigation scheduling based on what you want to do. And if you pay close attention and you're the manager, you, you, you are responsible for irrigation, you can come up with your own irrigation scheduling. And I, if you've heard this before, I work with a table grape grower in the San Joaquin Valley. He produces flame seedless. Generally speaking, uh, one year, his this is packable yield, was 24 tons per acre. This is what he put in boxes and he shipped. And so I went in and I asked him, how do you base your irrigations here? Do you schedule versus ET? And his response was, what is ET? <laughs> so if you've learned how to irrigate your vineyard on your own and, and forget all this stuff, well, that might be good. If you want to have somebody come in and consult and tell you how to do it, then you can always blame them if something goes wrong. So that's probably good too. But again, um, 
it's up to you. And again, there's going to be a lot of technologies that are discussed here and a lot that you'll be able to pick up and take back to your own vineyards. And I like to thank uh, Khan for starting early so I can get done early and that we can have break time in seven more minutes. Thank you very much. Well, well, first question. Will these be available? To, yes. Yeah. I didn't get mine in before here. That's why you don't see it. Yes. Paul, can you, you show a linear relationship between uh, cross-section or ET and, and um, let's say, light intersection? Do you have a specific range where this... I showed, I showed the linear relationship between the KC and, um, the, and the um, percent shaded area. I didn't show, I do have data showing, showing that too. So I see you, the, the, the scale of the graph is 80% shaded area. Uh, there are situations oh. where you have an overhead almost 90 to 95%. And if you project your relationship, your KC reach 1.7. Yeah, so is this, you, you have a, a range of, of canopy shaded area, or shaded area, percent shaded area, where you think your relationship can be valid uh, and extrapolated? The highest, the highest shaded area I've got in the lysimer situation was about 80%. The highest shaded area I've gotten in commercial table grape vineyards is about 80% because what they do is they split the canopy so there's shade right down in the middle. They go in there and ultimately hedge between rows so there's about this much area. So again, the highest I've gotten there is 80% and that's a 1.4 KC. With regards to Trees, you would have to talk to Ken Shackle about that. No, I'm not talking about the tree. I'm talking about if you go to travel to Chile, if you travel to France, if you travel to Italy, you got, you got wine grapes growing on overhead trellis that cover almost 95%. Of that. So in that case, I know in well water condition, the crop profusion has been measured. I mean, the ET has been measured. Yeah, the crop profusion yeah. is about 1.12, mm -hmm. 1.19. Well, the question, the question always remains, and, and this is, the KC is for a non-stress vine. And so when you, you measure a, you're measuring this, are those vines actually not stressed for water? Do you, do you know that they're not? Do they have a water potential value of less than 10 bars? And that's, that's the big question that has to be answered. And that, that would be also like perhaps using Surface renewal in a wine grape vineyard in San Joaquin Valley, we know that they're probably not going to irrigate at 100% of ET. So if you come up with the water use from surface renewal, is that actually a KC or is that just water use in that particular vineyard? Which has to be answered. But anyway, you think the relationship will, will be valid up to... It'll be, I think it's valid up to 80% coverage okay. for, for vineyards. Yes. With what? Row orientation, or do you Good point, that? good point. Have I done anything with row orientation situations? So, I developed the KC for, for VSP and, Char, and Chardonnay and Carneros, and it was, you know, it wasn't true east-west, but it was east-west. Up in Napa here, in, in Cabernet, it paralleled Highway 29. So that's, sort of northwest, southeast. The KC I developed down there worked up in Napa. I've actually measured shaded area underneath those vines. And what I found is that Mandavis had less shaded area under their vines, both north, south, and east, west, than in other places where, KC, or where shaded area is measured in VSB trellises, both on north, south, and east, west situations. So what I, again, what I found is that you know, when, when, when you develop a KC, this gives you an estimate of what it might be. Uh, a lot of times in, in growers' vineyards, when I ask that they irrigate a certain amount, they never did, and so that's why those values are up and down. So it, it's pretty hard in a, in a situation like that. At the Kerniak Center, when we've done it on our own here, again, if I apply the amount of water that it required, I always get the values that I need, regardless of whether it's north, south, or east, west. So again, yes. Oh, the other thing is I've had a student who did some uh, modeling of light interception. A true north-south row intercepts 
34% more light than a true east-west drill. But when you start looking at north, northwest, southeast, or northeast, southwest, they're about the same. So again, unless you're in a true north-south row, you, you may need more water than you actually ultimately end up applying. Yeah? Are you doing much study with single high water? With what? Oh, mechanically box pruned vines. No, I haven't. The, the, the close I get the mechanically pruned vines would be um, the, the simulated machine pruned vines on the Syrah and Fresno. That would be about the best I could do. Now, the uh, KCs, uh, we get them a single high wire and uh, 11 foot spacing, like six and a half by uh, 11, seven, and a, seven foot by uh, 11. I mean, the our KCs in uh, San Joaquin Valley were uh, approaching 0. 0.68 there. Yeah, okay. It will be a little bit higher, maybe a 0.7 for a KC there. So, but I mean, uh, the uh, relationship uh, still holds through. It's, it creates a sprawling canopy after the uh, shoots are flop. So, you know, what you could do is, is go out there after you, you get full canopy and just me take a tape measure out there and get an average width and, and calculate percent shaded area and multiply it by 0 0.017. And that would give you a, 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 at least an estimate of what it could possibly be. You know, we did quite a bit of work off of uh, Jahant Road uh, by, by uh, Lodi in uh, District uh, Little on uh, single high wires. Like, like Larry said, uh, uh, there are quite simple systems to manage for uh, irrigation, in our opinion, especially for our uh, whites. Yes? Yeah. Uh, my question is about the vertically trained pines. So if you measure the shaded area, it's just a little circle on the ground, which I think is not representative for the total canopy. No, I don't disagree with you there. But surprisingly, when I measure the sh shaded area under my Chardonnay vines up here, uh, it was 1.7 square meters. When I measure shaded area on the, on the VSP trellis sort of north-south here, it's 1.42. So again, you know, I, I, I've used the KC develop on an east-west row, on a north-south row, and they work fine. And, and for the other trellis systems, Liar and, and California sprawl, it doesn't matter whether it's east, west, north, south, north, south, east, west, or whatever it is. They work pretty good. Yes? I would just add that ultimately when you do all these calculations, you know, a difference in KC a little bit one way or the other, it ends up being like 45 minutes difference in runtime. Right. And so if you got a gallon per hour, I mean, it's like three quarters of a gallon, whatever. You're right. You're right. 